Welcome to Crime Watch UK. We're live. We're waiting for your call. A year on from the murder of seven-year-old Tony Ann Byfield in a gangland shooting, her killers are still at large. Help catch them tonight. Tony Ann Byfield usually lived with a foster family in Birmingham. But on the 13th of September last year, she was in London, staying with her father, Tony. I'm going to give you a pink one you? right Daddy. here. You no, like it? No, it's not school uniform. <laughs> he was like taking her to right, get some uniform it. for school. That was something where he loved doing, he loved shopping. That was Tony's style. So, Titi, what size you wear? Mm. You don't know? No. Size, um... 60, no, not 60. <laughs> he would come, pick her up, and, you know, once him say I'm going shopping with her, you know, you could see the glee in her face, you know, and the brightness in her face, because that is something she enjoyed doing herself as well. Oh, so that's the right one? I can see she was such a sweet little girl, really, really sweet. It was such a blessing to have her as, a, as part of our family. Nice, you look really nice. Do you like it? Yes. Yeah. Nice. All right, um, go back inside and get changed, yeah? All right. Yeah, may I come around later, yeah? We're with TT. I'm bringing her with me, yeah? We know definitely right. that oh, he was mixed up in certain things. You ready, TT? He didn't play a perfect father for them, but he really, really loved them. He was, there was his life, trust me. He really, really loved him kids, them. There you are. Expected you ages ago. Tony usually tried to keep his children away from his business, selling crack cocaine to street dealers. But that night, Tony Ann was staying at his bedsit for the first time, and he had to take her along. Yeah, watch the television. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm a television man. Mm. Yeah, sit down and relax, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> They left at a quarter to midnight to make the short journey back to Tony's bedsit. Titi, mm. it's time for bed, you know. Police in London are investigating the murders of a seven-year-old girl and her father. They say the little girl this has been is shot This is Tony Ann Byfield, seven years old, shot in the back, and the youngest victim of the escalating gun violence in Britain. The same killer shot her father, a convicted crack dealer who so survived Tony another So Tony Ann didn't live in the flat. Year. In fact, she was only here by chance visiting her dad for the weekend. And she almost certainly died because she was the only eyewitness to her father's murder. When she was so small, she used to cry a lot for me. So what I used to do washing the dishes, I used to have to put her in, in the sink, put her on the sink to sit down, and her foot dangling in the water and kicking over the plates and everything. And, <laughs> oh my God, she was such a sweet little baby. As time goes by, it's sinking little by little, little by little, you know, and then that's when it starts to affect me, say, you know, Titi, no more, she gone. Somebody really take Titi from us, you know, in such a brutal way. Well, this is Detective Chief Inspector Neil Basu. And as it turns out, we know now that Tony wasn't Tony Ann's biological father, but nonetheless, he was very close to her. Why would anyone have wanted to kill him and then murder Tony Ann? Well, I mean, that is the big question. And uh, what I can say is that we know that Tony was a drug dealer, um, but what we now know is that he was connected very closely to a major gang that runs cocaine between Jamaica and, and the UK. This the, the British Link Up crew? That's correct. What I, what I need is I need people in and around the British Link Up crew to tell me what Tony's status was in that gang. I don't know whether he was working for them or whether he was working against them before he was killed. Now, people have come forward in the gangland community in Britain, haven't they? But you want more information about an incident that happened a bit earlier on in Jamaica? That's right. Um, in June last year, Tony travelled to Jamaica for three weeks 
Now, he was there to see his children, but while he was there, he also attempted to collect a debt of up to £25,000. Now, he annoyed someone so much that they tried to shoot and kill him in a hotel. And I need people in Jamaica and people over here with contacts in Jamaica to tell me what that was all about. Now, people are going to be nervous about coming forward, given what's happened. Can you offer them any kind of protection? All I would say is that the Metropolitan Police has a very long established tradition of protecting witnesses and the full support the Metropolitan Police will be given to witnesses brave enough to come forward. Now what about this knife? This bread knife was, was found at the scene. We don't know how it got bent. Um, what can you tell us about it? Right, it's an ordinary domestic bread knife. Um, on its own doesn't seem to mean anything but I can't put it in the flat. And it wasn't used in the killing? It wasn't used in the killing. Tragically it had the blood of both victims on it but what it also has it's got somebody else's DNA on that knife which is as yet unidentified but I'm hopeful. Now what about witnesses who might have seen a person or persons going in to the flat, coming out of the flat? Well this happened at 25 past midnight on the uh, 14th of September and between quarter past and half past there's CCTV images that show that there are at least 30 people, various cars and cyclists going up and down that road. Those people must come forward, very few have. And the ammunition as well, you've got some interesting clues on the bullets that were used. Yes, we believe the bullets have been manufactured by an armourer um, they've been, it's a 9mm self-loading pistol, the weapon, but the, the bullets themselves are in Israeli and Winchester casings. And on the, uh, one of the casings, there's clear milling marks where the ammunition has been ground down to fit the gun. Now, I'm appealing to an armourer. If anyone, if you've done that job for someone, they've bought it, they've ordered that weapon, please tell us. You did not manufacture that to kill a seven-year-old girl. And there's one person in particular who's called Crime yes. Stoppers, isn't it, that you want to hear from? Yes, over the last week we've had several calls naming a particular individual. I want to appeal to that person that's calling in. That individual is of great interest to us, and please, please call my incident room. And again, you can offer protection if need be. Absolutely. Well, if you're hesitating about calling in, just think what the killers did a year ago and ask yourself if they should still be on the loose. And there's a £25,000 reward. Our number's almost always on the screen, or you can call the instant room on 020 8733 4704. All calls will be treated in confidence, but if you prefer not to talk to a police officer, you can ring Crime Stoppers anonymously on 0800 555 one. Still to come, the Cinderella clue to a killer whose foot fits. Take the next left. The trucker in Croydon hijacked at gunpoint. The granddad of all con men helped get him to retire. And who took the tub? Water and all. First, though, we've got some good results on cases from the last few months, all thanks to Crime Watch viewers. Back in April, for example, we asked for help in finding a man wanted for a sex attack on a 21 year old girl in Edinburgh. As a direct result, two important witnesses came forward. The police have now made an arrest. In June, we named a man who was believed to have stolen maps from the National Library of Wales. Thanks to calls to crime, watch police were led to Colchester, where a man's been arrested and charged. In July, we appealed to find a con man who'd been posing as a barrister in Devon, in London and other places, swindling people out of money. Police had a pretty good response, the now named Robert Spencer. He's 61, he comes from Yorkshire. They've also acquired this new picture of him. Last week there was a sighting of him, pretty good one. We think in Devon, detectives think he may still be in the Devon area. Well, as you can see, your calls really do make a difference. We know from many viewers that feedback on results is very important, so let me bring you up to date. Since Crime Watch began 20 years ago, 53 murderers have been brought to justice in cases of rape and indecent assault. 60 people have been convicted. In violent assault, the figure's 49. Of all the robberies we've appealed on, 108 criminals have been caught and convicted. In cases of burglary and theft, Crime Watch viewers have helped bring 69 people to justice. When it comes to fraud and deception, 74 people have been found guilty. And these cases were all solved thanks to Crime Watch viewers. So see if you can help with the next one. Who do you know has a big barn within a few minutes' drive of Croydon in South London? The barn has to be big enough to take a lorry and a car. It's a curious case, this. It's a hijack at gunpoint at the height of Russia, and so far, with no witnesses. It is 7.30, Captain Breakfast Show, me, Johnny Vaughan. Good morning to you, London's 95 point. But it's absolutely solid, heading the other way, clockwise. 
It's here on the Brighton Road in Causen, where a lorry was making its way to Croydon, and then on to Bromley, where it was carrying thousands of pounds worth of electric equipment. As normal, at the beginning of his journey, the traffic was very, very congested. The driver didn't see anyone approaching the lorry. The first he knew was when the passenger door was open, so someone in the traffic must have seen this man approaching. Take the next left. These were the only words used during the course of the hijack. The driver was directed by hand signals, and these took him up here into Woodmanston Road. The journey ended at Grove Lane, a residential street known locally as The Mount. Then they sat in silence for maybe 30 seconds. We believe the car had been following the lorry. When it's got here, I believe it's turned here and then reversed to the back of the lorry. According to the driver, the car was an old-style green Vauxhall, but the number plates were covered up. Someone in the car pulled down the armrest and pointed the gun straight at him. He was driven for maybe 20 minutes, and there must have been a third person involved because the lorry was in convoy. It's a difficult vehicle to drive, so that third hijacker must have been an experienced trucker. The driver found himself in a large barn where the goods had been unloaded. Out! Get out! The driver was locked in the back, then forced to the floor because of the erratic motion. When the lorry was found, the side panels had been completely bent and then torn away from the side. This means it must have been driven along narrow roads. After another 20-minute drive, the lorry was abandoned by the Mitchley Hill Junction. Friday, the 23rd of July. Did you see it being parked or notice anything unusual? I've been driving trucks and buses for 10 years. I was never threatened or attacked or anything like that on the buses. All my driving jobs never had anything like this happen. Now, every time the door goes, every time the phone rings, I jump. I just can't sleep because of the nightmares. A driver's truck was carrying plasma screen TVs and other home entertainment equipment. Some of the serial numbers of that stuff are listed on our website. That's at bbc.co.uk forward slash crime. Take a look. If you've bought something like this at a sale recently, whatever, if you can trace where they come from, you could help solve what is a very, very serious crime. Don't be worried about uh, saying who you are, but you can, if you prefer, call anonymously. Are your numbers on the screen? Nick Downing and uh, his team here are waiting for your call. If you prefer, you can ring their instant room where their colleagues are waiting too. That's in Croydon on 020 8649 1217. And now, here's DC Rav Wilding. Thanks, Nick. Do you often watch the programme and wonder if this time you'll be able to help with one of our cases? Well, maybe tonight. Here's our latest batch of villains, all of them caught on camera. First, attempted armed robbery at a branch of Barclays Bank in Farnborough, Kent. A man dressed as a biker enters the bank brandishing a handgun demanding cash. He threatens an elderly woman knocking her to the ground, then escapes empty-handed. Although the man's face isn't visible, his clothes are. Do you recognise his distinctive helmet and the Campri multicoloured ski jacket? There's a reward of £15,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of this man. Who is he? Next, deception in Manchester. This man, calling himself Joseph Gill, opened an account at the Lloyd's TSB in the city centre and deposited over £61,000 worth of stolen cheques. A month later, he returned to the bank to withdraw that money. Do you know his real name? 
And where is he tonight? To Devon now, and credit card fraud in Barnstable. This man is using clone credit cards to buy goods. Here, he's managed to spend over £1,600 on ladies' jewellery. On the same day, he also bought designer clothes from a boutique next door and an antique watch. In total, he spent over £7,000. Can you name him? And now to another man who has a fondness for jewellery, this time in Windsor. He's keen to have a closer look at two Rolex watches in the window. After showing the staff which ones he wants, he tries them on for size. While comparing the two, he dashes out of the shop, taking the watches with him. Do you know who he is? Don't let him get away with it. Give us a call. 0500 600 600. In our next case, cutting-edge forensic science has uncovered a crucial clue which could lead to a killer. Our reconstruction follows the account given by the victim's fiancé. She was a very outgoing young woman. She was very bubbly, very gregarious, really, as a person. I think we found Mandy's bridesmaid's dress. <laughs> Could you see her wearing that? <laughs> Mandy, we found your bridesmaid's dress. It's peach with pistachio trim. <laughs> all, all they both wanted to do is just to, to tie the knot, as it were, and then, and then get on and have their life. They were both, both looking forward to, to uh, the, the wedding ceremony. <gasps> We've got to make a thing. She's got the worst bridesmaid's dress in the world. Definitely. <laughs> oh, come on, let's go home. OK. I think Felicity had, had, had found in the last year, 18 months, she, she really wanted a, a marriage and she found somebody that she felt she was happy with at the time. If I take it, the next you ready for bed? Yeah. And if I don't take it, the next... Kill you. Now's your time to die. This is where we found Felicity's body. And she was laying in a, a large pool of blood. She'd clearly been subjected to the most vicious, brutal attack. The murder weapon we later discovered was a 22 centimetre knife, which was actually from her own kitchen. There was blood all over the walls, throughout the house. We brought in a forensic team. They were actually in here for uh, about a month, uh, from 8 o'clock in the morning through to 10 o'clock at night. And in all, they raised about 1,200 forensic exhibits. But in particular, what we were really interested in is um, a footprint in the blood down here. And the footprint went through the kitchen and stopped just in front of the window, obviously leading us to believe that whoever was in the house at the time had exited through the window. There, there were three obvious footwear marks on the kitchen floor leading from the hallway to the kitchen window. Uh, we used to a technique called luminol to try and enhance these marks and to see if there were any other marks there that we couldn't previously see. Luminol reacts with the blood to make it fluoresce, so any small amount of blood stain there will fluoresce quite strongly. So here, here's a photograph of a, a drain lid just outside the scene, just outside the kitchen window. There's nothing very visible to the naked eye. 
But when we used the luminol chemical on it, it, it was quite dramatic and it actually brought the, the mark up so it could be very, very clearly seen. There were, there were other marks on, on the, uh, the pavement floor leading away from the scene. I say they weren't too obvious as bloodstain marks, but once again, when you apply the, the luminol chemical on it, the effects were quite dramatic and you could quite readily make out footwear marks leading from the scene. When the scientists raised the footprints outside, it was absolutely clear to us that someone had actually been in the house at Felicity's murder. Uh, the first footprint landed just outside the window and there were several more going up the road towards Queen's Road. Tango 1 to 21893. Can you attend 262 262 Queen's Road? Reports coming in first and second. I just think all, all the time that, um, that we can't find the truth of what really happened on that night, um, none of us can get down to, to putting it all behind us and, and getting on with our lives. Well, this is Detective Superintendent Dean Jones. Uh, Dean, there's a touch of the Cinderella about this, isn't it? You're, you're not so much trying to find a shoe, but you're trying to match that footprint. Yeah, indeed. And at the moment, we're concentrating our efforts on tracing predominantly male people in Portsmouth uh, with size 9 to 12 feet. What about a motive? Well, we don't know what a motive is, and that's what we're really hopeful for tonight, that some of the viewers will, will know a little bit more about this and, and hopefully they'll phone in and, and give us that information. We really need to know what the motive was. There's a number of people that you'd like to track down tonight. You're looking for witnesses in particular who might have seen a man running down the street at what, in the small hours of the morning? Yes, about five minutes to uh, three in the morning on the 27th of February, a postman leaving his house in Percival Road uh, in Portsmouth, saw a man crouch down behind a car and then run off down uh, Percival Road. He's wearing what, uh, I mean this is pretty ordinary black puffer jacket, but it was a, a puffer jacket like this one. It's a puffer jacket just like that, in fact the, the, the postman actually was kind enough to point one out for us which we, which we purchased for the purpose of the programme. But he was, um, the person who ran off in Percival Road was about five foot nine tall in late twenties. Now there was also a man uh, running down Queen's Road. Yes, this was about 5.35, uh, again 27th, about two and a half hours after the murder, and he was running down Queen's Road, and um, just after the, uh, the clip you've shown, he actually ran into a person riding a bicycle. And so you'd like to know, if, I mean, there could be obviously quite innocent reason why he was, he was running down that road, but nonetheless, if for no other reason, you'd like to hear from him to eliminate him. We'd like to eliminate him, yes. And then someone has rung Crime Stoppers. Yes, this was around about the 20th of August. Um, a person phoned in to Crime Stoppers with some very, very specific information, and we really, really want to talk to that person again. And of course, you can't be sure if there were any witnesses. If there were, you want to hear from them. And I should reiterate, this is a very frightening crime, but it's very rare, isn't it? It's very rare indeed. And, I mean, if there are witnesses out there or people that have overheard conversations in pubs or elsewhere, then please let us know. We've actually done quite a lot of research nationally about similar crimes, and this sort of crime is very, very rare. Well, please help if you can. Felicity's father's put up a £10,000 reward for information leading to the conviction of the murderer. Our number's on the screen, or you can talk to Dean's colleagues in Portsmouth on 02392 899 899. Over the last few months, we've been featuring hit-and-run road deaths. It's um, often hard to call them accidents because they're really much more like consequences. They're the direct actions of drivers involved. Our next case, well, this time, thankfully, the victim survived. In fact, uh, here she is with us. Um, Kate Sheedy, tell us what happened to you. It was, um, this was in Hounslow, this was at yep, West London, Isleworth. Yeah. Um, on May the 27th, um, I was coming home after a night out. It was my last day of school. I'd be broken up to study for our A-levels. Um, so me and my friends had been out celebrating in the night in Twickenham. Um, at about 12 o'clock, we headed home. I got on one bus and they got on another. Um, at about half past 12, I reached my stop. At home? At home, um, very near my house. Um, I got off the bus. Um, shortly after getting off the bus, I saw a car parked quite a bit in front of me. Um, it, I was instantly you know, surprised by it. It was, it was a car I wasn't used to seeing there. Um, the lights were turned off, but I could hear the engine running, and that just struck me as very odd. Um, I got a very bad feeling from it and didn't want to walk past it. So I crossed over the road so I wouldn't be walking on the same side as it. Um, I then reached um, the entrance to the Waterton Industrial Estate 
As I reached this, the car turned its lights on, revved its engine, and did a U-turn in the road and drove straight towards me. Did it see you, do you think? It, it, it was deliberate. I'm sure the car that drove towards me deliberately because it could have gone straight on, but instead it veered to the left. Um, the car then hit me, it drove over me, then reversed back over me and then just drove off. It reversed back, deliberately drove back? It deliberately drove Over you? Yes. Over what part of your body? Um, my upper body, my torso. And how, I mean, how big was the car? What sort of car was it? Was it was um, a people carrier, a white people carrier. A people carrier? A white people carrier went right over you and then went over you again? Yeah. What sort of injuries did you have? Um, very, very severe crush injuries. Um, the most severe was my liver. It was both crushed and fractured. Um, I also had uh, multiple broken bones, my rib cage, my collarbone. I had one collapsed lung, a punctured lung, and a very severe wound to my back, which was a very large open wound, sort of caused by the underneath, underneath of the car. So it was a white people carrier. What else do you remember about it, um, it apart had, from the fact it worried you because yeah. the engine was running, it was dark, the lights weren't on? It had blacked out windows and also black wing mirrors. Black wing mirrors? Yeah. Well, this is color. DI Steve Leonard who's in charge of the case. Oh, okay. how, how many cars like that are around? Is it not possible for you to just go and check them all out? In actual fact, Nick, it's very, it is very, very common. And I'd like to say that we're very fortunate that Kate is actually still with us because it was a very, very serious attack and uh, she suffered very serious injuries. Now, we were hearing just in the last case about a case that's rare, an event that's mm -hmm. rare. I've never heard of something like this, of somebody deliberately targeting an individual with a vehicle mm -hmm. for no reason, hitting them once and then hitting them again. I agree with you entirely. I've been a police officer 20 years and I've never come across this either, Nick. Um, I'd like to make an appeal for witnesses. Clearly there were a possibility of passengers in that vehicle and I'd appeal to them because they must have been appalled themselves by the behaviour of the driver and likewise there may have been damage to that motor vehicle and if anyone's had to repair any damage to the vehicle I'd urge them to come forward and help us with this inquiry. I gather you've got quite bad scarring now. You, you must have. How keen are you that back. this guy is found? <clears throat> I just, you can't get away with something like this. You have to pay for your actions and they must have a conscience. Someone must, someone must know something, and I just hope that someone knows something and comes Absolutely forward. Absolutely bizarre, this. They ran over Kate, they ran over her again, quite deliberately. Please call us here, 0500 600 600, or try the instant room in Hounslow on 020 8247 6250. And incidentally, if you've been the victim of a crime, would like to talk to someone about it, you can always call the victim support line 0845 3030. 900. This year's England match against Portugal at Euro 2004 on Thursday, the 24th of June, hit the headlines because of events on the pitch. Oh, it's come off the defender, Owen! And England have scored! Michael Owen, two minutes and 25 seconds! To be replacing Wayne Rooney. What a sad state of affairs for him and England. Campbell's at the bar, it's free, it's in! So, no, no, it's not in. The referee hasn't given it, I don't think. So, Campbell is... Selling. We all thought that was a goal that was going to clinch it, but following the match, events in Croydon kick-started headlines of a different sort. Police say around 70 people were involved in the disorder, which lasted until midnight. So far, nine individuals have been charged, but detectives are asking for help in identifying these men. And DC Jackie Hames is here. Jackie, you know a bit more about what happened. Yeah, I've just been talking to the investigating officer and, in fact, the trouble started, as you say, at the end of the match. People spilled out of the pubs and clubs and bars, fuelled by alcohol, unfortunately, and approximately, in fact, 200 people ended up being involved, including this group here. And um, they picked up weapons just off the street, bollards, lumps of wood, and went about smashing up businesses, shop doorways, cars, uh, anything really that came in their way, which is really quite frightening for the poor passers-by. And also fans who genuinely want watched the match and just wanted to go home peacefully. So it involved a lot of people, unfortunately. It must have been very scary. And were people injured? Yeah, there were a number of injuries, including a lady who got hit over the head with a bottle and received a, a nasty head injury. And a police officer who tried to effect an arrest that night, unfortunately received quite a serious leg injury. And in terms of the people involved, not that much is known about them. We've got their pictures, we want no. to find out who they are. Exactly. We just want people to look at these pictures and say, please ring in with who they are. OK, well, thanks, Jack. And if you know any of these men, here they are. Call 0500 600 600 or the instant room in Croydon on 020 8649 0162. Now here's DC Rav Wilding with latest on the calls we've had tonight so far. 
We've had a number of calls in about the murder of Tony Ann Byfield, including someone who's called in with a name. On the Croydon lorry hijack, we're getting lots of calls from people who've been offered TVs. What we really want are more witnesses to the offence. On to deception in Manchester, that was caught on CCTV, and off-duty police officers called in and actually named the offender. So it's all really encouraging stuff. The studio number is on your screen, and if you're watching on digital satellite TV, you can email us directly through your remote control. Just press the red button on your handset and choose Crime Watch. Now, there's one more way you can help tackle crime. The Taking a Stand Awards are run by the Home Office in partnership with BBC Local Radio, amongst others. They're your chance to nominate people who've tackled yobbish behaviour in your area, including vandalism, graffiti and nuisance neighbours. Go to the takingastand.org website for more information or you can call 0800 085 2980 during office hours. Assuming you're over 18, think back to where you were in 1986. 18 years ago, not long after Crime Watch first went on the air, we appealed about a murder in Southport in Lancashire. The case remains unsolved, but the inquiry has now been reopened. There's new evidence as a result. And we can say now much more on Crime Watch than we could back in 1986. Not least that the killer was sexually very violent. Let's think logically about this. What we have is Nigel Bostock. He was 31. He lived just outside Southport and he owned a shoe shop on Wesley Street. He was a gay man who lived on his own and he was known to visit gay clubs in Liverpool, Blackpool and Preston. We also know that he never used to use a safe for his shop takings. In fact, he'd take the money home every night and put it in his fridge. It could be that the person who killed him knew about this. So the day after he was killed, his work colleague tried to call him but couldn't get through. She then phoned another friend who went round to the house. Nigel! Nigel? Nigel? He'd been strangled with the wire from his electric blanket, stabbed in the chest, and then his killer had tried to electrocute him. Fibres from the carpet in the kitchen. Right, OK, that's all right. John, good to see you again. How's it going? Not bad, thanks. Yourself? How are things looking in here? Well, it doesn't take brain surgery to suggest that there were more than just one person there last night. Hold on, don't take that. I want to show it to the boss. After you go. Yeah, just straight through there, boys. I mean, look at the number of beer cans. Hey, he wants one of these. Oh, yeah. You're not drinking? Oh, no. Yeah. Cheers. You see, the thing is, one of the other officers found the ring pull from one of these cans in Nigel's car. So, whoever drank the beer opened it and probably started drinking it in the car. And it was more than likely someone Nigel picked up on the night he was killed. Cheers. All right. Well, I've got for you. Oh, nice one. And one of them. Then some more back at mine if you want. Yeah. All right, come on. Let's go. That's actually cannabis there next to the ashtray. There may be more drugs involved, but we haven't found any. No, no, I don't think so. We know he wasn't into anything like that. He hardly even touched a drink. But what's this? £700 had been stolen from his briefcase. Yeah, it's in here that it's all started. Seems to have been quite a night. Police believe Nigel and at least one other man took part in a sexual activity involving asphyxiation, using the cord from his electric blanket. My guess is that Nigel died in the bedroom of strangulation. Then, whoever else was involved brought him through here to make sure he was dead. That was nearly 20 years ago. But all the exhibits from Nigel's house had been taken and stored, waiting for advances in technology. In relation to the case of Nigel Bostock, um, an assessment of the 
exhibits still available showed a number of uh, quite exciting opportunities, really, from a beer can, a potato peeler, and the electric blanket. For example, with a beer can, we would simply swab, using a small cotton wool bud, uh, the area around the mouth region where the person, if they drank from the can, would have, would have had the mouth and lips in contact. Um, and then that would be sent to the DNA profiling uh, unit. So uh, carrying out those techniques now on materials and exhibits from those crime scenes can be very valuable in, in um, introducing new evidence. So let's see if we can find yet more evidence. This is Joe Bostock, Nigel's sister-in-law, Lisa Bostock's Nigel's niece, and Detective Superintendent Mick Turner. You've now got DNA, so all you need is the name. That's right, we're in a very strong position investigatively because of the work done by the forensic people. So as you say, all we need is somebody to call in tonight with a name. Or names, because of course you want to find whoever was at that party that night. We're quite sure there are at least three other people there besides Nigel. They may or they may not have been involved in the killing. If they weren't involved in the killing, after all these years have passed, they may now feel confident that they can come forward and speak to the police. Now, if they weren't involved in the killing, there are two possibilities, I suppose. One is that they left before Nigel was hurt. They That's knew right. nothing about it. The other is that they were there, had nothing to do with it, but are absolutely horrified. And they're going to be very, very frightened about calling you. What's going to happen if they do ring? I can understand how difficult it will be for them. Years have gone by. It was a very um, horrible crime. They may feel they're going to get treated badly by the police. I can assure you that I understand how difficult it will be, and we will treat them very gently and with sensitivity. Their information is extremely important to us. So far from them having a tough time, it's going to be the opposite. Well, the information they give us will be so important we will treat them as they, as they deserve to be treated for coming forward. Joe, for the family, of course, this is absolutely catastrophic, appalling, not just losing Nigel, but uh, one, it's easy to forget, 18 years ago, being gay was sort of a lot of people were secretive. Very few people had come out compared to now when it's sort of very, very straightforward. So, so it must have been particularly difficult for the family. It was incredibly difficult. We were devastated. He... Um... He didn't tell anyone he was gay. Like you say, there's no shame in it now, but there was a great deal of stigma then. Perhaps he felt that he was trying to protect us. Perhaps he thought we'd be ashamed, but in fact, we wouldn't. You know, we would have stood by him. Um, but of course, it's totally different now. Straightforward, nice guy, owned, owned a, a, a shoe shop. Um, Lisa, you must be terribly young at the time. How, how much do you remember about this? I was only actually 11 when it happened, but I remember it vividly because uh, I was actually on holiday with my father in the Lake District when the police came to inform us um, of the murder. And it's just had a huge effect on the family over the 18 years. It's just been devastating, especially for my nan, who's never got over it, probably never will. But it's, it's had this huge... You see, I, I suspect that whoever was at that party and hasn't come forward, has consoled themselves with the fact, well, it was 18 years ago, there's no point doing anything now, but there is a point, is there? Yeah, I mean, he was such a lovely guy, he was kind, gentle, sensitive, he would never have hurt anyone, and that makes it all the more horrific that somebody did that to him and got away with it. You know, we just, there must be somebody out there that knows something, and we just, please, just come forward and, Tell us then we, it's never going to bring Nigel back, but of course it might help us put him to rest, finally. And given the ferocity that after the killing they tried to stab, they tried to electrocute, I mean, you must be pretty worried about what this guy's since done or what he's still capable of doing. Of course, even though it's 18 years ago, this was, as you say, a horrific crime, a lot of violence used. Uh, I don't believe that that's the only thing that person's done wrong in their life. And remember, he's been stealing, he's told as well, it's a typical pattern that... Give us a call if you've any idea. Please think about it if you must, but please call if you were there. 0500 600 600, or you can call the Instant Room Direct. That's on 01 695 566 566. And there are gay police officers there to take calls if you prefer. We've another rose gallery of faces for you to take a look at next. The crimes they're wanted for include kidnap, robbery and drugs trafficking. First up, Joshua Carney is wanted for a series of thefts and burglaries around the UK. Originally from Dublin, he's moved around from Lancaster to Jersey. He uses several false names, including Mark Moffat, Devon Daniels and Aaron Wiley. Joshua Carney has an Irish accent, a pierced left ear and a large birthmark on the centre of his back. Detectives say he's friendly and articulate, so beware. He can easily charm families and children into trusting him.
James Walter Tompkins has been charged with robbery and impersonating a customs officer, but he failed to answer bail. He has receding grey hair and speaks with a South London accent. He may have links in Hammersmith and Fulham and has been known to work as a market trader. Mark Thwellwell is suspected of being involved in a large-scale drugs trafficking gang in Bristol. He's wanted for importing cocaine worth over £100,000 from Jamaica. He has a young family in the Bristol area, but he may be living in London. He's got a very prominent scar across his forehead, which he covers up by wearing a baseball cap. He may be better known to some by his street name, Trucks, and he's very well spoken with a West Indian accent. John Charles Moorcroft is wanted for kidnap and robbery. In June last year, he was involved in a hijack of a lorry in Selby, North Yorkshire, in which £70,000 worth of confectionery was stolen. He was arrested for the offence, but hasn't answered bail. He's also wanted for a serious aggravated burglary in Merseyside. Moorcroft speaks with a Liverpool accent. He has a scar on his left eyebrow and a tattoo of a cannabis leaf on his left arm. It's believed he might be living in the Kirby area of Merseyside. And do you know the whereabouts of Anthony John Brooks? He really is a one-man crime wave, and my colleagues across 33 police areas want to talk to him. Here he is in four different banks in the Thames Valley region, using other people's cards to obtain cash. In one two-day period, he obtained £60,000. Help us put a stop to his antics. Call 0500 600 600 if you can help with any of these cases. Our next case is close to home for us at the BBC. The victim was Tom Brown, who worked here at Television Centre in the Information and Archive Department, which is somewhere in the years I've been here, I've called frequently. Tom was stabbed to death a month ago, just before his 28th birthday. Anne Harris is Tom's mother, John is his brother, and leading the murder inquiry is Detective Chief Inspector Keith Garnish. Anne, what can you tell me about Tom? I think a mother doesn't know everything about a young man in his late twenties, but he was lovely, a lovely son. He was kind and he was honourable and he was generous. And nothing that I've learned about him since can shake that view that he was decent, that he was honourable and that he lived to a code that was his own, but strictly moral. He was a free spirit. He was going to live his life according to his rules, and they were good rules, and he did. And I think that at the time of his death, his life was opening for him with his job, a new house he was buying with his brother here, and He's been taken from us. And John, you, as, as your mum says, you were going to buy a flat together, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, we've been arranging to buy this flat, yeah, for months. It, it's, it's, you know, almost since the beginning of the end of last year, and we finally got it sorted. And we were literally two weeks away from completing. We would have moved, just, you know, in two weeks, and been out of Southgate, and it, it wouldn't have happened. And what, what can you tell us about what happened the night he was killed? He, he'd been out to the pub with his friends. They, they'd stayed drinking in the pub till, till closing time. Um, one of his friends lived close by, so they decided to go back to his house. They, they you know, carried on socialising at his house. Um, about three o'clock-ish, um, they decided you know, the, it, to, that Tom decided to go home. He was offered a place, you know, a bed for the night at, the, at his friends, but he said he'd rather go home and sleep in his own bed. It was about a 20-minute walk, he, he, so he walked home, and 150 yards away from the front door, he was attacked. Keith, what could be the motive for this attack? It seems to have come completely out of the blue. Yes, this is the unfortunate thing about this attack. It is a violent and unprovoked attack. We know there are no defence wounds on Tem, Tom, and we don't think he'd had any chance to try and defend himself. Uh, we rule out robbery at this stage because all his personal property was still on him. His uh, bus pass, money, were all in his pockets. Well, what about the knife? Have you recovered the knife from the attack? No, we haven't recovered the knife at the moment. That's one thing we're obviously appealing to the public, that any knives that are found in the area that are handed to the police. Now, there's one man you want to appeal to tonight in particular who who came on the scene after Tom was stabbed. 
Yes, this is the, the gentleman who initially rang the ambulance. Uh, this is a man uh, we've been described as a black man in an executive style car. He rang 999, stayed at the phone box until the ambulance arrived and directed them to Tom. He then left. We've now got the 999 tape to play so that person and hopefully people will recognise this gentleman's voice because we desperately need to see him and speak to him because he may be a vital witness. OK, well, let's take a listen to that tape now. Um, Hello? Hello? Yes, about 100 years from this telephone box, there's a man lying on the floor. What road is he on? Gra Green Acre, Green Acre Walk. Green Acre Walk. What's the problem there? I don't know. I'm just driving past and I saw this man lying on the floor. He's lying on the ground. Uh, by the bus stop, not by the bus stop. There's also a nightclub worker who, who walked past Tom after, as it now turns out, after he'd been killed. Yes, uh, he walked past Tom and saw him laying in the street and thought he was drunk. And what he says to us is that at the same stage, there was sitting very close to where Tom lay, was a man and a woman sitting on a wall. And again, we need to speak to these individuals because, again, they may be important witnesses for us and able to tell us who else was in the street at that time. And what about the man at the minicab office? What about him? Yes, uh, at the Crown Minicab office, a man went up, asked for a cigarette, which he was given, and then engaged in some unusual conversation. He was behaving very strangely, wasn't he? They thought he might be on drink or on drugs or something. Yeah, that's correct, and spoke about working for his daughter. We've got an e-fit of him, and if you recognise this person, please ring us. And, and finally, two men who were seen running along Meadway, wasn't it? Yes, very close to the scene, 100 yards away. Noticeable one of them in very white training shoes or shoes. Is that you? Do you know who they are? Please ring us and let me know if that means anything to you, those two individuals. And Anne, what would you, what would you say to anyone who might be able to help tonight, who might be reluctant to make that call to come forward? There have been so many tragedies recently, so many families affected. They seem universal, but believe me, the grief that each of these families feels is agonising. Whoever did it must have been very evil or very sick. Please, please, help the police in every way you can so that more families don't go through what my family is going through at this moment. Okay. The loss of a super brother, a super son. Okay, well, Anne and John, thank you both very much, and Keith, you. This was a totally unprovoked attack. Help catch whoever killed Tom before they strike again. The police have put up a £20,000 reward for information leading to a conviction. The number's 0500 600 600 or the instant room in Barking on 020 8345 3715. Let's see what more results we can get before the programme ends. It's about uh, 12 minutes to 10 yet, so there's still time for that. Uh, our next criminal that we're after, though, is known as uh, the granddad of con men. He's 64, we know his name, we know what he looks like. What we don't know is where is he tonight? There's a gentleman standing over there. I think I'll go and have a word with him. Okay. Hello. Hello, darling. You're new here, are you? Do you want to come in? Are well, I, I've just been working in the area, and oh. I, I thought I'd pop in and see what was going on in oh, here. Oh, it's a club we meet every Tuesday. Do you oh, want to come right. in and have a cup of tea? Oh, I'd love to, darling. Yes, thank you very much. Sorry, what did you say your name was? Could I have Peter. a cup of tea? Peter Gold. A cup of tea for Peter. Well, what's your line of business, then? Well, I used to work for Ealing Council, oh, but uh, yes. I just do a few odd jobs now in the district, you know, for old mm. people. A uh, yeah. bit of plumbing, a bit of decorating. Oh, are you a plumber? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. I've got such trouble with my central heating. He's making a terrible knocking noise. Central been... heating, no problem, darling. Oh, it would be wonderful if you could come and have a look at it for well, me. How long does this go on for? Well, we'd be packing up in about ten minutes, I suppose. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll hang around here for you and I'll walk you home and then we can have a look around your house. I can see what jobs you need doing. I'll give you an estimate. I'll have it done for you next week if you like. Oh, that would okay. be wonderful. Great. Wonderful.
So how long have you been coming here then, oh, Liz? Donkey's years. What do you mean, donkey's you how years? How old, old are you? Oh, I'm 79. 79? <laughs> I don't believe you. What, with a pair of legs on you like that and you're a snappy dresser, I reckon you can pass for 65 oh, easily. God. No, no honest, I'm not pulling it. Anymore. It was a five or ten minute walk and we arrived at about ten past twelve. <laughs> Come on in and I'll show you where the boiler is. You could make me a cup of tea first, could you? Oh, all right, yes. How do you like your tea? Oh, uh, black with no sugar, please. OK. Oh, lovely house you've got here, Liz. Uh, yes, well, I mean, it's nice and sunny. How many bedrooms have you got? Uh, two. You've lived here all your life, then? Oh, no, no. We've been here quite a while, but, uh... Oh, I can see some jobs over there in the kitchen that need doing. Oh, I know, I know. But it's not that that's really worrying me. It's the boiler. Oh, these. Hey, I've got certificates for working on these. He told me he was 65. He was bald on top with a fat face and small brown eyes, clean-shaven, bad teeth, and he had a faded tattoo on the back of his left wrist. I brought my bag out because uh, I expect you'll want a bit of money for the work that's got to be done. I never carry any cash around with me. I can never remember my PIN number. I've got a new mobile phone and I've put my PIN numbers in there so I can remember them. Oh. How do you remember your pin number? Well, I put them in the back of my black address book, disguised as a phone number. You're not just a pretty face, are you? <laughs> so, how much money do you think you'll need? Well, you, you couldn't spare 120 quid, could you? Well, I went to the bank today to get some money for my holiday. Spending money. Oh, well, if, you, if you're sure that's all right. Well... The work's got to be done. OK, then. Well, there's no time like the present. <coughs> right. I'll be gone about a couple of hours. Make me a cheese sandwich, will you? I made the cheese sandwich and waited for him. But he never came back. Stephen Johnson went off with the cash, then also withdrew £300 from her account. Hello. I used to do a bit of gardening for her. Did you? Hang on. Haven't I done some work for you? No, I, I don't think so, no, oh, no. I, I'm sure I have. Don't, don't you remember? Back two years ago, I used to come round with my son. He's a local policeman. He did a bit say. of work I, for I, me I, in oh, his time off. My bus, sorry. Oh, it's mine as well. <laughs> Do you mind if I sit here? Of course not. Yeah, I remember your place. Got a few hanging baskets. That's right. Well, I used to have them, but they've been let go now because I just can't get up the ladders to water them. Well, you know, that's the sort of job I could do for you. Really? Is, is that your trade? Yes, I do a lot of work for Age Concern. Not that you'd come in that category, of course, <laughs> darling. <laughs> yeah, I can do a bit of work like that oh, for you. Where do you live? Well, in fact, I live just round the corner. In fact, this is my stop here. Oh, funnily enough, I live just round the corner there. Do you? Yes. Oh, so, well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll come round with you now and... Um, OK. And well, I'll, I'll show you the things that need doing. It's so difficult getting help these days. <laughs> Nobody wants to do any other jobs, do they? Don't you worry. You're in safe hands now. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, that is wonderful. <laughs> Yeah. I've dreamed of meeting somebody like you. Yes, I've done lots of gardens around She too was conned out of money, in her case, £200. So what's he up to now? If you know the whereabouts of our Stephen Johnson, give us a call here, please. Free to the studio, 0500 600 600. You can call the instant room if you prefer in Ealing, West London, on 020 8246 9138. Now, it never ceases to amaze me what some people will steal, but this must take the biscuit. On Monday the 26th of April, a hot tub, just like this, full of water, was stolen from the back garden of Tony Hill's house in Bournemouth. Tony, when did you notice it had gone? Well, I came home from work, I had a really hard day, and I thought I'd just chill out in the hot tub, and uh, I couldn't believe it. I went in the back garden, and it has gone. 
And you must have thought you were dreaming. I mean, how much would something like this weigh? Uh, about five tonnes. Five mm. tonnes. So, Susie, how did they take it? Um, a male was seen to pull up in a flatbed hire lorry with a um, black crane on the back of it and pull up alongside the back fence of Mr Hill's garden. Uh, the crane was then lifted over the fence, picked up the hot tub and hoisted onto the back of the lorry and, um, and off they went. And presumably people must have seen this going on. Plenty of people saw it but thought nothing of it because it was midday and it... It they so thought it must brazen. be legit because it was so audacious. It was so Absolutely, yeah. And then what would you do with something like this if you've, if you've nicked it? I mean, would it have been sold on? Would someone have kept it for personal use? Absolutely no idea, really. I mean, I'd keep it for personal use myself. But <laughs> And then to take it full of water as well. Why not empty it out? That would have been much easier, It would have taken too much time. It would have taken about an hour to have um, emptied it. So. so you decided to take the whole thing? Yep. Well... The tub in question is a Sundance Cameo Spa. If you can help us put the splash back into Tony's life, call us here on 0500 600 600. News on the lorry hijack in Croydon. We've had lots of calls suggesting location for the barn, and a name was given to detectives to follow up. On the murder of Felicity Pageant in Portsmouth, two callers have given us the same name. We've also had a number of calls in relation to the Tom Brown murder, saying the accent of the 999 caller is in fact West African and not West Indian, as we first believed. I can tell you a little bit more about that deliberate uh, running over of uh, Kate Sheedy. Um, firstly, we've heard so that there may be um, a similar attack it, it took place in Croydon two or three weeks ago. We've also had a caller who's seen a white people carrier the day after Kate was attacked with damage to the front parked in his street. So that's obviously going to be looked at pretty fast. Uh, we've got uh, even more on the, on the Croydon lorry hijack. I have to say on that one, it is just astonishing how many plasma screen televisions are on sale for cash around the country for one reason or another. Um, somebody suggested that maybe we ought to find out what the numbers of our own plasma screens here are, make sure they're not nicked as well. I'm sure they're not. Uh, we've had interesting sighting of the con man who's been posing as a barrister. Sightings in the West Country, which we might tell you a little bit more about when we come back later on tonight. All the incident room numbers, if you've still got information you can give us, are on CFAX on page 61. You, 621, that is. You can see uh, a reminder of some of tonight's cases and there's crime prevention advice and more at bbc.co.uk forward slash crime. Our phone lines here are open until midnight tonight and then again from 7.30 in the morning tomorrow until midnight and again on Thursday. Now, what's the point of working on a programme like Crime Watch if you can't appeal, appeal about your own crime? My bike was nicked yesterday. It was 5 to 12. It's black with a child's seat on the back. If it was you, you know who you are and I'd like it back. Next month's programme will be on Thursday, the 28th of October, where we'll be asking for help in finding a brutal attacker in Bromley. We'll be back in about 35 minutes, 10.35, with Crime Watch Update. If you can't join us till then, remember, crimes we feature are very rare, so don't have nightmares unless you stole her bike. <laughs> Sleep well. Good night. Good night. <laughs>